Good afternoon, everyone, and uh, thank you, Lori, for the nice introduction, uh, as well as to the National Transit Institute for accommodating this webinar and for having us today. And also thank you all for attending. It's great to have uh, almost 300 now uh, participants, a lot of people who, who want to know about NTD, um, which is really phenomenal. Uh, and hopefully we'll, we'll satisfy that, that desire today to learn. Uh, this is a quick disclaimer that says we're here today just to provide clarity regarding the reporting requirements for the NTD. FTA is providing the webinar for information and its content does not have the force and effect of law. Um, so we, we hope this will be useful to anyone involved in the NTD reporting process and report year 2021 uh, for annual reporting that is. Uh, the high turnout means some people uh, might not have been able to make it and it, it also means that we might not get to all the questions today. We're certainly going to try. Um, if we do not get to your question, we will follow up with you afterwards. Uh, FTA will also link this webinar to its presentations webpage from transit.dot.gov uh, slash NTD. That's the NTD program site, and we'll uh, disseminate this link to reporting personnel identified on the contacts or P30 form in the online reporting system. So if you are on that form or if uh, someone you know couldn't make it today, but they are a uh, user on that form, you will receive uh, an email notification with this link. So while the webinar is intended for all reporter types, not every change will apply to every reporter type. There are some differences in reporting depending on the size of your agency, how many vehicles you operate at maximum service. If you're unsure of your reporter type, please contact your NTD reporting analyst um, to find out which of these will, will apply to you, uh, both the, the type of funding your agency expense and the vehicles you operate again will determine the, the type. So as Lori said, we welcome questions during the session. Hopefully you saw the instructions at the beginning about the Q&A and the, the chat pod. Um, we encourage you to use the Q&A bar to pose a question that may apply to the entire group. Uh, you'll be able to view all such questions. And if you're, you're unsure whether a question applies, please feel free to use the chat feature and you can select our panelists here privately and one of the three of us will answer or we'll hold your, uh, forward your question to your assigned NTD analyst if we can't get an answer to you today. And the Operations Center staff are dedicated to assist you with any reporting concerns. You can find information for your assigned validation analyst on the profile or the annual report package summary in our online reporting system. Okay, so the topic of today's webinar again is uh, changes in clarif uh, any reporting policy, excuse me, that's been changed or clarified or stratified in some way in advance of report year 2021. Uh, topics are presented here and our main focus of this webinar will be to discuss system and process changes for annual reporting, as well as provide updates uh, and offer clarifications regarding the data elements on the report. These are the most high impact clarifications that will appear in the upcoming release of the NTD uh, 2021 reporting manual. Uh, there will be other webinars that are tailored to more specifically to reporter types, including a session this Thursday that NTI is hosting, which covers the fundamentals for reduced reporters. Uh, so for full, for full reporters, there are also opportunities in the form of courses provided by NTI. Uh, the contact information you can use to reach NTD Help Desk, if you cannot reach your assigned validation analyst, is here. The service is available from 8 a.m. to 7 p.m. Eastern Time. can be used for technical questions related to NTD reporting. Uh, many of your questions may be addressed to your uh, validation analyst, but we, we recommend you contact the Help Desk if you can't uh, reach that person. Lori already gave us nice introductions, but our information is here as well. In case you cannot reach your assigned analyst or you need to connect to that person, we can connect to you. And then if you have any high level programmatic questions about the NTD for FTA, um, emails uh, for Tom Coleman, who is the NTD program manager, and uh, Misha Doni Smith Jackson, who is the chief of and the analysis division for FTA's Office of Budget and Policy, uh, which is the department that manages the NTD are found here. And finally, here's a page uh, providing hyperlinks to references. As I mentioned, the 2021 reporting manual, uh, reporting manuals are still in development 
In the meantime, you may reference the 2020 reporting manuals, which are published to this page. There are two manuals, a reduced reporting policy manual and a full reporting policy manual. Reduced and rural reporters will want to consult the reduced manual that includes uh, state DOTs uh, or the designated uh, recipient passing through to rural reporters. Uh, that manual omits data elements that are not required for your reporter types. The same is true for agencies who only report asset data, asset data to the NTD as a result of the transit asset management final rule. Uh, so those reporter types can find most of the information they need to complete the report in the asset inventory module section of the reduced reporting manual. FTA has also developed a guide that provides examples and discussion on uh, NTD reporting and COVID-19. FTA will update this ad hoc as clarifications related to the emergency and its impact on data reporting become necessary. Uh, note that the COVID-19 information collection tool is a separate uh, application within the Triad platform, and that is not uh, housed in, within the NTD. Before we discuss uh, the uh, clarifications resulting, uh, excuse me, before we discuss the, the clarifications in more detail, Lillian will present the important changes to the reporting system and the process for 2021. Thank you, Joe. Um, so I will be discussing several changes to the NTD reporting system that will go into effect for the 2021 NTD report year. Um, so for full reporters and small systems reporters only, there will be an additional step upon submission of the report. FTA is allowing agencies to choose which data year to use for the 2023 formula apportionment. So this is either 2019 or 2021. The year you select will be recorded and we will use all of the federal funding allocation data for that year in the apportionment. When you go to submit the report, you will see this page shown here on the screen. After making your selection of either 2019 or 2021, you will continue on to complete the submission. In the original submission of the report, the selection will default to the year with the highest vehicle revenue miles across all modes, and you can update the value that is selected. Uh, you will be able to make updates during each subsequent revision, and this page will show the value that you selected during the previous submission. So please make sure that the users who submit this report are aware of the page so it does not delay the submission of your report. So this may be the CEO or CEO delegate for the first submission and the entity contact for any later submissions. So another big update for this year will be the use of login.gov to log into the entity reporting site. You should have already received an initial notification about this update last week, and you will be, see, be receiving um, several notifications to come as well. So we are making this change because an executive order mandated the use of multi-factor authentication for federal agencies. Please note that the NTD reporting site will not change. You will still access the same NTD login page, but instead of entering a username and password on the login page, you will click a link for external users. This will direct you to the login.gov login page. And then once you log in, you will be redirected back to the NTD site. So Multi-factor authentication is the use of an other authentication method in addition to a password when logging onto a site. You will need to set up a login.gov account using your NTD username to retain your current NTD roles. Now, when setting up your login.gov account, you will be required to select at least one authentication option. The options for login.gov include a security key, which is a physical device like a USB that you plug into your computer. Um, you can also use an authentication application, which is an app on your computer or your phone that generates codes you use to sign into your account. Um, several examples of these are Google Authenticator, Authy, or LastPass. You can also enter your phone number to receive either a text message or phone call with a code to use to log into your account. The last option is for backup codes, which are the least secure option. You'll receive a set of codes and you'll enter one of these codes when you sign in. Each code can only be used once, and when you run out of codes, you'll be prompted to download a new list. Um, you'll receive more detailed instructions 
along with the cutover date as we prepare for this transition, so please look out for those via email. Um, another update is that we have added several new funding sources to the F-10 and RR-20 forms to reflect three acts that were passed in response to the COVID-19 pandemic. These three funding sources are the Coronavirus Aid, Relief, and Economic Security Act, or CARES Act, the Coronavirus Response and Relief Supplemental Appropriations Act, or CRISA, and the American Rescue Plan, or ARP. Um, these items appear under the 5307, 5310, and 5311 funding sources on these forms. Um, the last update will be coming later, um, so this will be in summer 2022. Um, as a result of the 2020 census, urbanized areas will be redefined. We will be sending full reporters, small systems reporters, and states a task after the 2021 report year closes out. This task will allow you to reallocate your federal funding data based on the 2020 urbanized areas. The data that you reallocate will be either your 2019 or 2021 data, depending on which year you chose in the apportionment year selection page that I mentioned several slides ago. We will provide updates as we get closer you can check this page linked here as well. I will now turn it back over to Joe Eldridge, who will discuss other important policy changes and clarifications that FTA is making. Thank you, Lillian. Uh, the first change is more of a review of a new feature in the reporting system, but it does have an impact on the identification form, the P10 form in the uh, agency profile in the report. Um, you may be aware that FTA recently updated this form to allow for querying of address information, basic agency information from SAM.gov. The system now allows you to pull information from that system uh, using your um, data universal numbering system, the DUNS number, which you also report on the P10 form. So if there is a uh, value found, a valid value for the DUNS number found in SAM.gov, uh, you may click retrieve reporter information from SAM.gov, which is visible in the screenshot below, um, to import that information. If you do elect to use this feature, please make sure the data that returns is accurate before you save the form. If it isn't accurate, please enter the, continue to enter the data manually on the P10 form for your uh, address information. In the last report year, uh, report year 2020, FTA waived the requirement to report condition assessments for a total of 75% of facilities for which each agency has capital replacement responsibility. This is on the A15 form. A minimum of 25% of additional condition assessments would have normally been uh, expected in the four-year transit asset management cycle. So up uh, from 50% in uh, report year 2019 to 75% in report year 2020. FTA clarified that while it was waiving this requirement universally in report year 2020, agencies should still anticipate reporting all condition assessments by the end of the cycle, that is by the end of uh, this upcoming report year 2021. FTA recognizes that in some cases, this may not have been possible due to safety or scheduling concerns um, and condition assessments uh, may have had to be rescheduled. If this applies to your agency, please contact your validation analyst and request a template for a data waiver from this requirement, listing the facilities that are not yet assessed and the percent of uh, the total facilities that your agency uh, has capital replacement responsibility for. FTA has clarified that transit and truck or TTP priority lanes and uh, freight access and transit, freight access and transit priority lanes, or F-18 lanes, are not considered fixed guideway or high intensity bus uh, for the purpose of MTD reporting and therefore should not be reported. Uh, agencies should note this policy moving forward as it pertains to the directional route miles, uh, the, the uh, segment length that is on the segments form in the profile, P40, as well as the directional route miles that come from that form um, that are allocated on the federal funding allocation form. Uh, 
FFA 10. Another clarification regarding directional route miles is that segments which are or were temporarily out of service, meaning that for a time there were no transit vehicles carrying passengers over these segments may still be reported to the MTD. Uh, these cases, agencies are encouraged to submit documentation indicating the duration of the outage uh, to the assigned validation analyst, indicating uh, construction dates and written announcement for press releases if those are available. This is especially important when the outage lasts for longer than an entire fiscal year. FTA will review each such request and may request that segments are removed from the reporting system, depending on the level of detail uh, you are able to provide. So this concludes the routine policy updates and clarifications. I will now turn it to Matt, who will review important clarifications during the ongoing national public health emergency. Thank you, Joe. So last August, FTA published the COVID-19 reporting guide uh, in order to address unique reporting questions raised by the COVID-19 pa <clears throat> pandemic. And we've revised it several times in response to new questions from agencies. So I'm going to review the highlights for you today. First, this isn't a reporting question per se, but it is a question that's on everyone's mind. How will COVID-19 affect the apportionment of FTA funds? Uh, so first, let me point out, um, actually, it was pointed out by one of our, our participants. There is a typo on uh, an earlier slide, slide 10, uh, where it referred to 2022. Uh, it should have referred to 2023. Um, so I apologize for that. You're probably familiar with the uh, policy that FDA published for the 2022 apportionment already, which is based on reported 2020 data. In that apportionment, FDA used either report year 2019 or report year 2020 data, whichever had the higher vehicle revenue miles or VRM. FDA did not mix and match data from different years. It used either all your 2019 data or all your 2020 data. This ensures that agencies that had large service decreases are treated fairly in the apportionment. The 2023 apportionment will be very similar. FTA will use either 2019 or 2021 reported data, whichever has higher total VRM. And like last year, you can request that FTA use the year with lower total VRM if you believe other factors will make that the better year. As Joe mentioned, the 2023 apportionment will be based on the new 2020 census data. Some agencies have wondered how to report average weekday, Saturday, and Sunday data when schedules change so drastically during the year. Each daily average should be an average over the entire report year, no matter what schedule changes you made due to COVID-19. So if you made long-term long changes to your schedules because of COVID, as most agencies did, average daily data will be much less than in a normal year. If you had days when service was completely shut down for one mode and type of service, then don't include those days in the average. Instead, report them as days not operated. You may recall that last March, FTA advised you to suspend NTD sampling if your sampling procedure uses ride checkers who ride the vehicle. FTA also canceled the 2020 mandatory passenger miles sampling year. So the next mandatory year is 2023. There are no changes to that policy. However, you should feel free to resume in-person sampling if your agency determines that it is safe. You shouldn't expect an all clear announcement from FTA to resume sampling. We're leaving it up to your judgment of your own local situation. Let's review who has to sample when. First, the largest directly operated modes, those in a UZA over 500,000 population with total agency VOMs, that's vehicles operated in maximum service over 100, are required to sample every year. For everyone else, meaning agencies in a UZA under 500,000, agencies under 100 VOMs 
and purchase transportation modes, sampling frequency depends on your UPT, your unlinked passenger trips. If you have 100% count of UPT, which would usually come from registering fare boxes or APCs, then you have to sample every three years during the mandatory year. If you do not have 100% count of UPT and you sample to collect both UPT and PMT, then you need to sample every year. So let's talk about how those rules apply during the pandemic. You can find this chart in the COVID-19 reporting guide. I'll summarize this information on the next slide. If you can collect data without violating your agency's safety policies, the normal rules apply. If you're an annual sampler and you use in-person ride checkers, then you should restart sampling when you determine that it's safe. And until then, you should work with your analyst to determine a reasonable method to estimate. If you're a triennial sampler, then you are all set until 2023. We all hope that by the beginning of fiscal year 2023, it will be safe for everyone to sample. If it isn't, we'll deal with that contingency as it approaches, but for now, we're assuming everyone can sample in 2023. Some of you use automatic passenger counters or APCs to collect data for NTD. If so, you know that FTA requires you to certify the APCs and recertify every three years. Like for passenger mile sampling, all agencies are on the same three year cycle. The next APC recertification year is fiscal 2022. Unlike passenger mile sampling, APC sampling does not take a full year. Most agencies are able to complete it in two to three months. The recertification report is due with your 2022 annual report. So for October reporters, it's due October 31st, 2022. So in most cases, if you start in spring or summer of 2022, you'll be on time. FTA is not changing any deadlines here. But of course, if you don't believe it's safe to complete the sampling, you shouldn't do it. And if you aren't able to meet this requirement for 2022, your analyst can help you request a waiver to push it to 2023. Many agencies have suspended or curtailed ride sharing in order to facilitate social distancing, especially on modes that don't have many shared rides in the first place, like taxi or TNC, you might have stopped sharing rides during the pandemic. If this is a temporary suspension and your policy is to resume ride sharing once the pandemic ends, then FTA is still considering that service to be public transportation and you should continue reporting it to NTD. We do ask that you let your analyst know about any limitation to ride sharing, just so we have that context for why your service characteristics have changed. Some agencies are deploying extra buses to reduce crowding in order to facilitate social distancing. You might call this double heading or shadow buses. This is when you dispatch two buses to a route instead of one. The second bus might be open to passengers from the start, or it might just follow along until the first bus reaches its capacity and then open. You also might not schedule a double header bus, but might just dispatch them as needed in response to daily conditions. All these cases are reported the same way. The extra bus miles and hours are considered revenue service and should be included in VRM and VRH. The travel to the start of the route and back from the end of the route is considered deadhead, just like for the first bus, and is reported in total miles and hours, but not revenue miles and hours. A slightly different way of accomplishing the same thing is to have a floater bus stationed at some convenient location and then dispatch it to a route if it's needed. If this is how you operate, then if that floater bus does get dispatched, 
then its deadhead and revenue service get reported just like on the previous slide. But if the floater bus isn't needed and just returns to the garage without being used, you should not report any miles or hours for that bus. Finally, on the A30 form, you report seating and standing capacity for your vehicles. The purpose of the form is to reflect the characteristics of the asset, not any temporary policies. So if you made a policy of reducing the capacity of the vehicle during the pandemic, do not make any change to the A30 form. Um, everyone's muted. I don't know who's speaking. <laughs> I'm sorry. I think we reached the end of the presentation, actually. Oh, okay. <laughs> what happened? That was abrupt. Uh, so, sorry. Yeah, to... sorry. It, just, it didn't seem like any, there was like closure. I thought, oh, something happened. Anyway, okay. So we yes. have to read here again our help desk information. Um, so, Lori, we're, because we've got time, we're available to take more questions. We've had a lot of good questions coming in. Yes, um, there's been a ton of questions. Um, there's actually two in the Q&A box right now. If we want to uh, turn our attention to that, um, there's, the first question wants someone to go over and explain submitting selecting year for apportionment once more. Could we do that? or? Sure. Uh, Lillian, are you able to go back to that? that slide. I think you could just navigate back. Uh, slide, there you go, 10. And before Lillian dives in, um, Tracy and I think someone else had also pointed out, like Matt said, this was the slide that had the uh, the error on it. It's that the last part of the sentence should read FTA's FY 2023 formula apportionment. Uh, apologies again for the confusion there. Uh, report year 2021 data is used in federal fiscal year 2023 apportionment formula. So there's a lag of two years. Um, Lillian, are you able to just run through this slide again? Sure. Um, so this is what um, you will see when submitting the report. So this is for full reporters and small systems reporters only. So when you go to submit the annual report, each submission, you will see this um, page, and in this page, you will select which year's data will be used for the 2023 formula apportionment. So you are selecting either the 2019 or 2021 um, report year's data, and all of the data for that year will be used. Um, so when you um, go to submit the report for the first time, the um, Selection will default to whichever year had the highest vehicle revenue miles across all modes. Um, but then each subsequent submission, um, you will see this option as well, and you'll be able to update it, make any changes if you um, decide you want to go with a different year. Um, and the um, one that will be selected on each subsequent revision will be whatever you selected in the previous revision. So like I mentioned, the person who is submitting the report might not be the person who's working with the data. So you'll want to make sure that um, you are aware of this question and you're prepared to let the submitter know which one they should select um, before they go to submit the report, just because um, you don't want it to be a surprise um, and them not to know um, what this question is about. And we have a couple of related questions that I'll just cover now while we're still on this. So with the first one from, from Tracy, I was wondering about the direction that TA would automatically apply the better data with the NTD directions that we have to choose. So I think um, the, the confusion there is, uh, will FTA apply their own heuristic or do we choose? Um, and the answer is, as Lillian explained, 
the, the heuristic is going to apply, going to select for you, if you, you know, choose to ignore this and do nothing, it will select for you the year with the highest uh, annual total VRM across all of your, your FFA forms. Um, you can undo that total if you wish. Uh, you know, if some analysis or look into the data is leading you to this decision, and we definitely recommend consulting with other stakeholders within your agency of selecting the opposite year with the lower VRM. Um, you may apply that selection. Hopefully that answered. And then another question from Jim, uh, just to confirm, even if we use the 2019 numbers for apportionment, we would still report all of our 2021 data. That's absolutely right. On the FFA 10 form for report year 2021, uh, there are no changes. In fact, that data will be read from the uh, service and operating expenses forms. And if you operate on a fixed guideway from the P40 as well, all your 2021 data. Uh, uh, another question from uh, Victor, do the NTD formula apportionments apply only to VRM or also PMT? In other words, will the FTA automatically use either 2020 or 2019 based on the year with higher total PMT? Very good question. So the answer to that is no. They're using VRM to make the decision in every case. For all agencies who report VRM, uh, it will, the decision on which data year to use will be based on the higher total vehicle revenue miles. Now that said, all of the data from that year will be used and that includes PMT as well. So that's one thing to take into account. Uh, if you're you know, looking at a very large decrease in PMT uh, across all of your FFA 10s, but uh, an increase in VRM, you, you might wanna look at that closely before making a selection here. So that's another, another good question. Um, and I see they're still coming in on this. The, uh, Tracy asks, the apportionment data year selection does not apply to rural reporters or state reporters. Um, that is correct. Only uh, full reporters and reduced reporters will see this, this option. Yeah, Joe, maybe it, it would be worthwhile mentioning that um, FTA is making the same effort to um, produce a, a fair and unblemished apportionment for the, uh, the 5311 program for the state and rural reporters. Uh, the difference is just that in the 5311 program, the only data point that uh, comes out of NTD that goes into the formula is VRM. So in that case, there's just no ambiguity about which year is the better year for apportionment. So FGA is just automatically using the year uh, with greater VRM for rural reporters. That's a great point. Um, so moving on from this, we've still got a lot of good questions coming in. We'll try and take as many as possible. Have the additional funding sources, CARES, CARISA, ARP, been added to the A30 as well? Um, not as individual funding sources, no. Um, I believe you would just select the the most appropriate funding type, if that's the, the question on the A30 form, um, which is based on the, the degree of funding from federal or, or non-federal, like local or state programs. Um, Matt, would you like to take this next question uh, about, uh, are we required to report floater buses only related to COVID or for service in general? Sure, so that's a great question, Miles. Um, so the, the policy I described for reporting floater buses is not specific to um, the COVID-19 period. It's the same rule every year. Um, we brought it up now just because a lot of agencies are making increased use of floater buses during the pandemic. Um, and so we've gotten that question a lot more than we had in past years, um, but it's the same rule every year. The next question is from Mountain Line Transit. Uh, demand response service stopped due to the pandemic. However, later, later decided to return to the service. How would you like us to report that? They discontinued it beginning February, 2020. Um, so it, it depends on the data point you're discussing. And we just like, we, we covered some of the caveats around reporting today, but generally 
the, the service that you're providing, as long as it was public transit uh, before the pandemic and, and still is after that, still making attempts to, to share rides and uh, is open to the public, you would report the resulting service statistics. And the question might be about these operated, uh, which we covered, Matt covered uh, so, uh, the, the S10 uh, like daily averages. If that yeah, is Joe, right. I think the question is, um, the, the service never came back into operation. Um, so how should, should they report okay. that? And that it correctly later decided never to return yeah. the service. Uh, so I, I would say in that case, um, on your profile, you should enter an end date for that mode and type of service. Um, and that end date would be, uh, I guess it, it looks like February 2022, or sorry, 2020. Uh, Matt, would you like to continue with the next question regarding APCs? Sure, this is for Mauricio, I think. Um, the uh, APC certification requirement is exactly the same as it has, has been for the uh, past years. So if you were approved in 2019, uh, you should do exactly the same thing you did in 2019. Okay. Um, do you want me to, you guys seem to be having a fine time reading the question, so I, I don't know that it helps if I'm reading them out loud to you, but you oh, let me know. Be that'd be great, Lori, would, would you mind? No, no, that's fine. Um, they're, I'm just going to go in order the way I see them. Um, someone who is anonymous, mysterious, uh, are small system waiver agencies able to use passenger miles traveled in the UAF apportionment? So uh, I can feel that. So yeah. uh, the answer is no. Uh, small systems or reduced reporters, as, as they're sometimes called, uh, do not report passenger miles in the NTD. Um, so that data point is not included in uh, formula funding. Okay. Um, Suzanne is asking, um, are transit may go up to a large transit based on the 2020 census results. Please confirm, we'll know those census results summer 2022 and the increased large transit reporting would start for the year 2022. That's a good question. So a couple of good questions. So the first I think is about when, when uh, Suzanne references large transit, like the size of the urbanized area um, based on the 2020 census. So we're hearing tentatively from the Census Bureau that uh, early summer 2022 would be the release of that, that data set. We do not have a firm date yet. Uh, the plan is uh, if you are an NTD reporter that files an FFA 10 form to reallocate that data um, once the, the new census urbanized area list is available. So you would go in and select the primary and secondary UZAs in which you operate. Um, again, tentatively, that, that task will be scheduled for summer 2022, but we'll be providing a lot more information as we get closer to that time about exactly what you need to do. Um, and it is great to be aware of the, exactly this kind of uh, change that could happen uh, because it can have impacts not only for reporting, but beyond that for how the NTD data will be used in, formula apportionments. Yeah, if, if I could just um, jump in and address that a little more, it, it looked like the questioner might have been asking about reporting requirements um, and possibly had some misconceptions about um, NTD reporting requirements. So in, in NTD, our two main tiers for urban reporting are, are full reporting and reduced reporting. Um, and that's based on your agency size in terms of VOMs, vehicles operated in maximum service. Um, so it, it's not based on whether you're a large urban or a small urban um, area. There are a couple of reporting requirements that depend on um, UZA size. Uh, you might remember from this 
uh, presentation, we talked about the uh, annual versus triennial passenger mile sampling. Um, and it, it's a different rule depending on whether you're over or under 500,000. Uh, but it, the vast majority of our reporting requirements are based on your agency's size as measured by VOMS, not based on your UZA size. Thanks, Matt. Um, Sheila would like us to go to slide 18 and please define the term transit lanes. So I think the question is probably about uh, freight access and transit lanes. Um, and I don't know if we have a, a, a definition published for this, but we'll clear, FDA will clarify in the manual that these are uh, uh, lanes that are shared by transit with uh, trucks or with, with freight. Um, and either or depending on the mode. I'm not sure if that's the question or the question it might just be about what are the lanes in general that we're talking about. And what we're talking about is uh, what would normally be classified as fixed guideway or a high intensity bus lane um, in the NTD on the, the reportable segments form. So there are more, there's a lot more discussion on both of those terms in the reporting manual as well. Um, I, I recommend probably consulting that if that's the question because there it's a little too much information to cover here today. Hopefully that that answers it. And please feel free, uh, Sheila, to follow up if that did not. Great. Maybe um, maybe put that last slide or whichever slide of the contact info. Just put it up for a second in case uh, Sheila needs to grab yeah. that. We could do that. Perfect. So if you need more information, here's where you go. Um, the next question, I'm, I'm going to mispronounce your name, so I'm probably going to just skip it. The next question says, if you are not receiving federal funds for the HOT, is it HOT or it should be HOV, maybe it's a typo, lanes, why do you still need to report them to NTD? Yeah, the, the why for reporting is a little bit out of the scope today, but um, I will say this is, is this HOT and, and fixed skyway lanes, uh, useful information to know um, the restrictions on certain segments of bus or fixed skyway modes, definitely useful for, for research. But again, the, the why, there may be more to that, that's really covered in. Um, uh, federal register notices and the like. Uh, so I would I would probably start there if you can find any information online about why FTA uh, decided to start collecting information about hot lanes. And off the top of my head, I don't remember when that, that was, Matt, you may recall. And that was about HOV lanes to clarify. Yeah, I think the change in policy for HOT lanes was somewhere around 2014 or 2015. Okay. Okay. Um, Tracy, oh, well, that's just a thank you. Well, thank you for expressing your gratitude, Tracy. Madison says, when exactly will the NTD Appian site implement the multi-factor authentication via login.gov. Uh, another good question. And this came up, I think, er earlier in the uh, Q&A as well. We don't have a firm date yet. Uh, the target is around the same time as uh, the launch of the reporting system, which would be mid-September. Okay. Martin says, are there any changes to the A series reports or the policies governing them? Martin, there are no major uh, reporting changes to the, the A forms or the A series schedule. Um, 
there may have been one change to remove a vehicle type. I'm trying to remember if that occurred this year. Um, that's no longer applicable, but that would be a, a minor change like to our drop down menu. Generally speaking, no changes to the requirements there. Uh, we did clarify it about condition assessments and the requirement there, um, the expectation there. That was the, I think the only asset related change we covered. Sorry, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. Oh gosh, I'm sorry. Oh, I'm really sorry. Oh, that's my door. Okay. So I can take the next one. So further clarification of freight transit lanes, how would this guidance apply to transit lanes with a restricted period of freight access? For example, 24-7 bus lanes with delivery access overnight. That is a tricky question. I don't have an answer for that. Um, and I don't yeah, I, I would say mo most likely you would have to report those as um, bus lanes with a uh, restricted period of hours operated. Uh, so on the P40 form, one of the data fields that you report is the number of hours of operation for the bus lane. Um, so I think most likely in this case, we would have you report the hours as just the um, just the period when the lane is available to transit and not to freight. Um, but I would advise you to contact your analyst with more detail, and we can uh, we can look at that situation uh, individually. Okay. Thanks. Sorry again. My apologies. Um, Eric had a comment about implementing a platform change right before NTD is due. I think. Do we need to address that further or? Right. So I see Eric clarified responding to the target being the same as the release of the reporting yes. system. So to clarify too, the change is not to the NTD application itself. It's to FTA's um, access control and entry system. Um, which we all use to get into the NTD and other uh, FTA uh, uh, sanctioned applications, trams, ECHO, those may be familiar to, to some, but not all. Um, and so the, the timing is uh, definitely not ideal, but I guess it's also not, not the worst it could be. You'll be expected when you log in for the first time to complete your annual report to set up an account and and uh, this new system, login.gov. Um, so it's not right before the deadline, uh, it's right when the reporting system opens up. And it won't, and again, I think as Lily mentioned, it won't have any impact on the NTD application itself. Great, thanks. Um, I'm trying to look at the timestamps on here. Uh, Nancy says, in regards to the next sampling year, 2023, just to clarify, we are to begin sampling in 2023, or should sampling be completed in 2023? Uh, I can address this. So uh, for passenger mile sampling, um, FTA's requirement is to complete sampling for the, the full year. So you would begin sampling uh, at the beginning of your fiscal 2023, and then that sample would continue for the full 12 months. Perfect. Um, <clears throat> did we, I don't know if this is a repeat. Um, any estimated date for posting the RY 2021 policy manuals? Got my task for the kickoff almost two months ago. The data is due back in October. I can't do too much yet because there isn't updated guidance. So you'll want to consult the report year 2020 manual uh, in the meantime. Um, the, that, that's going to give you the best and I think most congruent information in almost all cases. And the major differences 
uh, between the 2020 requirements and the 2021 are the ones we covered today. Um, so I would I would use that as as kind of the uh, the delta from last year. If you're hesitant about reporting certain items, uh, but you don't see that guidance yet, definitely encourage you to refer to this. Uh, it shouldn't be long until this is released. Again, the target is to do that before the the launch of the report year, which as we said, is in mid-September, um, but we'll provide information if we're not able to hit that on, on what to do and, um, and uh, again, what the differences are. Great, um, and, and finally, well, might not be finally, but finally for now, Brandy says, just for clarification, triennial reporters will do sampling in fiscal year 23 for the report to January 31st, 24. The report won't be due for everyone on January 31st. That will depend on when your fiscal year ends. Oh, so if it ends on uh, September 30th, 2023, um, then yes, that will be your 20 fiscal year 2023 report. Um, that's a good question. For others, it may end uh, in uh, July of 2023, uh, or excuse me, end of, uh, end of June 2023, June 30th. And you, you will have to, uh, that group will need to report by, uh, presumably, you know, dates don't change from what they have been. It will need to uh, report by October, end of October. Uh, but you got, I think you've got the years right, the spacing right. It's the first report, the first due date after your fiscal 2023 year ends. Sampling needs to be conducted during that year. Okay. Oh, late breaking question from Rogelio. Uh, the 2023 sample will be used as a base for future years. So I think Rogelio's question is about uh, the, the frequency in which you need to sample. There is a good exhibit for that in the reporting manual. Um, yeah, he says yes, okay. There's a good exhibit to determine your sampling frequency and if, it can, if it can be the base, uh, if you're a triennial sampler for the next two years following your, your sampling year. Um, then the answer is is yes. You can use your uh, average passenger trip length and apply that to your only passenger trips. Matt, I don't know if you want to add anything on that front. Um, yeah. So that's you know assuming that you are a triennial sampler. Um, and uh, Lillian, do you maybe want to go back to that um, that flow chart that goes through the sampling frequency. Yeah, that's the one. Um, so if according to this flow chart, you are a tri triennial sampler, then um, yes, most likely your last completed sample was 2017. Uh, you were planning to do a new sample in 2020. Uh, and then obviously COVID-19 um, threw a wrench into the works. Uh, so the 2020 mandatory year has been skipped. Um, and then 2023 is uh, the next mandatory year. Um, and so, and yes, you would use that, the um, average passenger trip length from your 2023 sample uh, to estimate your passenger miles traveled for 24 and then 25. And then in 26, you would do your next mandatory sample. Okay. He says, cool. Um, he, I'm sorry. I don't mean to assign pronouns. Forgive me. Rogelio says, cool. Thank you. So um, I think that answered the question. There was a question in the chat box from Randy Lamb, and I, I don't know if we, we might have touched on this. It says, has the year's guidance for NTD updates been released? And if not, when do you expect this year's guidance to be available? Uh, we did cover that. I think it was probably around the same time. Okay. The question was asked. Uh, Lily's hand is raised, and I don't know if they 
know that or it's an accident or if there's a question, but um, there doesn't seem to be a question in the chat or the Q&A box. So I guess we can pause for a moment and see if any additional questions come in. Again, if you do have questions after this ends, the contact information is on that slide, which is in your handouts. Just wait a second. Uncomfortable with dead air, but there was a lot of questions answered. I guess I'm comfortable that there are no more questions. Okay. Everybody else? Thank you all for the great questions. Yes, this was for the participation. Yes, this is lively audience. Um, so if there are no further questions, I would like to thank everyone for participating. A special thank you to, to Lillian, Joe, and Matt. Great presentation. Everybody was uh, very informative. I hope this helps everyone who participated. As a reminder, you should be receiving an email from us at NTI with uh, an evaluation for this webinar. Please just take a few minutes to fill it out. We really appreciate your input and it helps us, you know, change things up and, and improve as we go on delivering uh, these sessions to you. Um, I, oh, one more thing. <laughs> People were asking about the recording, which is in progress. Uh, this will be posted hopefully by the end of the week, beginning of next week on NTI's YouTube page. I can put the chat uh, the link in the chat one more time, or you can find the link on our website. Uh, I just have to do some editing, and then I will post the video. And that is it for me. Everyone have a great afternoon. Thanks again, everyone. And uh, we'll see you next time.